One of my absolute favorite genres in all of board gaming is dexterity games. Sometimes you don't want to test your tactical ability or your strategic decision making, but you want to test your physical skill, your digit accuracy. And for that, there's not really anything better than dexterity games. They will test your flicking and your pushing and your moving around in a physical space. Now, you might have played things like Jenga, but Jenga is for cowards. So we're going to look at some of the best dexterity games that you can play right now. In Cube Quest, you and your opponent, or multiple opponents if you're playing in teams, will be flicking small plastic cubes at each other like so. Nice shot. If you manage to get one of the enemy's cubes off of the board, then that cube is removed from play and is taken away for the rest of the game. However, if any cubes that you flick go off as well, they'll also be taken out of play. Play will continue back and forth, each team taking one flick each, until you manage to knock the opponent's king off of the board. If you manage to kill the king and get him far away from this land of cubes and questing, then you will come out as victor. That's pretty much all the rules. It's a very, very simple game, but there is a couple of extra details that makes this game very special. First of all, if a cube of your color goes into enemy territory, that's past this wall here, and instead of landing on one of these detail faces, they land on a silhouette, then that means you'll have to see if they get captured. Roll the dice, and if you get a silhouette again, that character is dead. Get a full detail face, and they go back to your castle. That's the first rule, pretty simple. The second one is a little bit more interesting. Now you'll notice that I've got all of my cubes here laid out in a formation. Well, at the start of the game, you're gonna be using both sides of the box to create a shield between you and the other team. In that time, you can place your cubes in any formation you like. Perhaps you'll want to get them in some kind of V formation so that you can get right down the center, right to where the king sits. Or maybe you want to go super defensive, locking that king who has to stay in his castle at the start of the game behind a huge wall of orcs. The possibilities are endless. In fact, you can even construct strange towers so that you can get some kind of height advantage for your first flick of the game. Cube Quest is incredibly easy to teach. In fact, I've pretty much taught you the entire rule set in the past couple of minutes. Underneath this silly rule set, though, is a very, very in-depth tactical sport. Not only do you have separate types of units, for example, your grunts are pretty bad at getting behind enemy lines because most of their die is made up of shadow faces, whereas these striker units only have one shadow face on the entire die. These guys are incredibly powerful, but you only get four of them. And that means that if you lose them at the start of the game, all of your attacks behind enemy lines are gonna be a lot more difficult to pull off. So perhaps you put all of your grunts at the front so that they can take the first couple of swings and make room for your strikers. Well, that's all well and good, but then who is defending your king? The whole reason that you're playing this game, the person that you need to protect with your life. If they're sitting in the castle at the start of the game, that means that you can't put them right at the front where all of those grunts you've shoved are. So now you have a question as to how to outline your forces. But not only that, your forces will be flicking around the table over time, which means that the entire battlefield will be changing with every flick. Perhaps you managed to get one incredibly strong hit that smashed through the enemy forces and opened a wide gaping hole in their central line of defense. Will they spend their entire turn trying to get your attacker out of harm's way? Or will they try and flick one of their pieces like so to try and get some kind of screen between you and the king, knowing that if they spend their turn trying to get rid of your attacker, you have an incompletely open line of attack for you to attack in in the next turn. That was a lot of uses of the word attack. It's very difficult to talk about Cube Quest without just revealing that it's a very simple rule set, and yet I think the complexity that it takes away from a lot of board gaming actually makes it a lot more palatable. Not only that, but it also makes it a lot more fun. It's so simple and easy to teach, and it's so quick and fluid that you can just rattle off about 80 games of this thing in one night. In fact, you will feel like you have to rattle off about 80 games of this because the one more turn feeling that you get from this game is so addictive Honestly, I could play this thing forever. It's one of those games that I don't think I'll ever take away from my collection because it is such a masterpiece of dexterity gaming. And not only that, I've never seen anything that beats it so far. But 
I'm willing to be proven wrong. And there's quite a few other fantastic games on this list, so let's have a look at those as well. Flipships is a pretty bonkers game, but it might feel quite familiar to those of you who have played a few arcade cabinets in your life. In fact, it's pretty much a physical dexterity version of Space Invaders. Now, flipships might seem quite strange to you, but don't worry, because there's one question that you can ask yourself, which I think will help you understand how this game works. And that question is, what if you weaponized tiddlywinks? <laughs> now, that might sound quite strange, but bear with me. This is a co-op dexterity game in which you are going to be fighting off space invaders that have come down to destroy your city. You and the mothership of the invaders have 20 health points each. If you get the mothership's health down to zero, you and your team win. If the city's health goes down to zero, you and your team lose. Using this little launching platform or the edge of a table, if you have one at hand, you're going to be flicking your ships onto these invaders like so. Ah! If you miss, then no damage is dealt, but if you manage to get your ship on top of one of the enemy invaders, you'll do damage to it. Not only that, but you'll also have these larger ships that have their own special powers. For example, you might be able to use this space laser to activate another attack via the length of this card and hopefully shoot down another ship in your path. The most challenging thing though is getting your ship from the launch pad all the way into this little mega ship bucket. Now that's a weird sentence, but watch as I attempt it right now. Absolutely biffed it. This is a genuinely really challenging game, and although it can beat you up quite a bit, it's really fun to go up against. It's not often that you see a dexterity game that's completely cooperative, and I think the camaraderie of doing a terrible shot or even just telling someone that they're awful at the game when they've completely screwed up your chances at winning, it's a really fun element to add to your dexterity games. It really is, as I said, as simple as that, but the rulebook does feel a little bit complicated for what it is. So if you're a little bit far away from getting to that level of rulebook reading that you need to be in for some of the more complicated games in the world, then it might be better to leave this one for a little bit and come back to it. But if you don't mind ripping through that massive rulebook and getting to the heart of this meaty game, I think it's really, really fun and really silly and it deserves a place at your table. In this absolutely honking huge box is a game called Catacombs. And it's one that differs quite a bit from the rest on the list in the fact that it is basically a dexterity game dungeon crawler. So instead of going through loads of pre-generated dungeons and rolling dice to do damage and collecting cards that give you special powers and all that nonsense, instead it boils it down to the very simple process of flicking your hero at the enemy to attack them. However, maybe don't throw away all of those gear cards and special powers actually, because not only does Catacombs have lots of lovely little boards and pucks to play with, it also comes with that massive deck of cards, because they also have one of the largest monster varieties in any dexterity game I've ever seen. There are giant scorpions and liches and zombies and skeletons and orcs and flame wraiths and the Cerberus and a giant dragon that's so fat that it rolls onto you instead of being flicked. And also a giant gelatinous cube, which with every turn will flip itself to a new damage type and maybe even eat you as well. Catacombs is completely bonkers in its scale. In fact, you could be playing with a completely different dungeon every turn because these cards are not only your gear and special powers, but they're also the rooms that you'll be going into. For example, the Forbidden Ossuary, the Cavern of Torhak, or the Ruined Sanctuary. You'll be building a dungeon out of these cards and then one unlucky player, or should I say lucky, will be playing as the monsters. That means that whilst you can play with two players and have one person be the bad and one person be the good, you can also split up the team so that you can have four good players going up against one bad. That makes this not only a incredibly deep and very very dungeon crawler about flicking hockey pucks, it's also an asymmetrically very deep and incredibly varied game about flicking monster pucks. 
It's really, really good and really pretty as well. The design is one of the most vibrant and different styles that I've ever seen in this kind of game, to be honest. Most dungeon crawlers go with that standard sort of swords and sorcery, Dungeons and Dragons style art. But this one really pops off the board and not only do you get massive mats to play on, there's flipping three of them and they're double-sided. So you can go from this ruined hall with a giant's bones in it, to this magma cave, to this fungus dungeon. Or maybe, you know, you'll start your adventure at your campfire, only to go to a fiery pit of hell. The, the possibilities are literally six of them. <laughs> However, there is also a massive load of expansion content that you can add into this. It's something that you could be playing for quite a long time. Not only that, the Catacombs franchise has expanded into loads and loads of different styles of game, including worker placement games and also a tactics style version where you have two equally matched teams who are going up against each other. The actual gameplay is relatively simple. On your turn, you're going to do a number of actions. You could just flick your hero and charge into the enemy, hoping that you get a hit. Or you can play one of their special abilities, like the Berserker's Battle Axe, that allows you to do four chain hits onto separate targets. In fact, there's quite a bit of variation between the heroes that you can play as. You could be the big honking barbarian who likes to do lots of damage to the enemy in melee combat, or you could be the tricksy elf who likes to stay at the back and fire with her bow, flicking a small arrow disc instead of herself. Maybe you want to play as the skeleton adventurer who is immune to poison damage, or perhaps you would like to take the wizard who has an entire deck full of spells which do loads of crazy things, including getting massive fireballs out of this very bag and shooting them at your enemies instead of yourself. There's lots of variation. In fact, if you look at the cheat sheet, you can see all the different kinds of damage that you can deal to your opponents. It's a really, really in-depth game and something that will take a little bit of learning to get into. However, most of it is pretty self-explanatory and the iconography is relatively easy to understand. Most of the monsters and the boss that you'll be playing as with the Catacomb Lord are quite complex and varied from each other. So if you want to take the brunt and be essentially the DM for this game, then you might want to put yourself forward as the person who's played the most board games. But you can grab someone who has literally no idea what they're doing and give them the most simple character and they can just flick away to their heart's content. It's a good level playing field for people to come in at different levels of experience and still enjoy themselves and have a good time. And it's also just bonkers. I love it. It's really, really good. There's also a third edition coming out soon with some slight tweaks that have upped the production value a little bit. It does come with this sort of, I guess you'd call it quite flimsy uh, looking wall set that you put around the board to stop the pucks flying around. Well, they've basically found a solution to make that a little bit less destructible. So if that sounds like something that you can invest your time into, have a little look at their Kickstarter. I'll put the link in the description and you can see what they're up to at the moment. But that is Catacombs by Eldra Games. If the question of Catacombs was, what if your dungeon crawler turned into a dexterity game? Then the question of flick em up is more like, what if we made a dexterity game out of Warhammer style miniatures combat? but we set it in a world with cowboys and you get to flick your little bullets at each other instead of rolling a dice. Well, that's what Flick 'em Up is. It's a miniature style combat game in which you flick your bullets and move via flicking a hockey puck. Now that seems like a simple concept, but Flick 'em Up is probably second only to Catacombs, the most complicated game on this list. But that's not to its fault. In fact, Flick 'em Up gives you a rule for pretty much anything that you need to do. Would you like to, for example, set yourself in a building and have some kind of spaghetti western style showdown in which you're taking shots at each other in tandem? Well, you can do that. Would you like to dive behind some cover and shoot around the side? Well, you can do that. Would you like to rummage around in some barrels, find a sniper rifle and shoot it at your friends? Well, you can absolutely do that. Not only does this game come with a book full of scenarios for you to try out, you can also pretty much just play it with your own setup. The box is loaded with all of these little bits of scenery, complete with cactuses 
hay bales, barrels, planks of wood, and even more cutely, these little buildings, even with a little working clock. Clock. Basically, what you're going to be doing is setting up a battlefield using these little plastic and cardboard miniatures and then fighting your way around it. Let's say that you want to take a turn and you're on the bandit team over here next to me with the red brimmed hats and the black models. Well, I'm going to grab this hockey puck to give myself a move action. I place it in place of where my character was and then I flick it using only one finger, not your thumb as well, into the new position I'd like to go to. If I accidentally hit something on the way, like I did just then with that other miniature, then the move failed. However, if I was shooting my gun at that miniature in question, then that becomes the goal. Oh god, everything's falling over. If I was shooting my gun at that miniature, then that becomes the goal. Instead, I'll take this even smaller little black bullet token and I'll have to flick it at the enemy. If I manage to knock him over then, that character will lose one of his life points, and if you lose all of your life points, you're out of the game. Now, depending on the scenario, that will actually possibly be one of your victory conditions. But there's a number of ways that you can play this game. You can go for that all-out slugfest where you're just trying to be the last man standing, or you could try and be the person with the most characters alive at the end of a time limit that you set on this turn counter on the clock here. Perhaps, as I've set up here, you've got some kind of friendly character who, if you don't manage to save him in time, will actually be hung at a certain hour, standing on the chopping block. But if you accidentally manage to shoot the barrel that he's standing on, perhaps he'll fall to his death anyway. Pretty morbid, and yet very colourful and fun. The list of scenarios in the Flick'em Up rulebook, which by the way is very pretty, is quite varied. You might start with a standard combat round and then move on to some kind of kidnapping scenario. Perhaps it's an ambush and you've laid down some kind of trap for the bandits who have strolled into town. But it's worth saying that the scenarios, whilst they're okay, they're not the most fun you can have with this box and they're more a set of tools for teaching you how some of the more complicated rules work out. As you go through the campaign, as it were, you'll pick up more of those special little digits that you can add into the game to make it what you want it to be. But the true experience is setting up your own scenario and then picking your side and going up against a friend. Now, usually I would say that the box going up from two to 10 players is pretty impressive, but that's essentially just you assigning one player to one person on the board. Whilst that can be quite fun to have your own little avatar, it also means that the game can take a long old time if you've got 10 people doing individual turns. I would say that the best way to play this is one person versus one person controlling the entire team. But you can always expand that so that you can add more people into the fun if you wish. Flick 'em Up is a very silly experience from the people at Pretzel Games, whose central core philosophy is that you should be able to hold a pretzel whilst you're playing anything they make, which I think is a good way to live your life. But if you want to try out some of their other experiences, they've got quite a few little dexterity numbers that you can pick up, including Men at Work, which is a kind of construction game in which you're going to be competing to put down uh, little bits of scaffolding, or you could try out Junk Art, which just missed off this list, and it's one of my other favorite dexterity games, in which you're going to be assembling really odd shaped pieces into little sculptures and following weird rules that make all the more chaos as you play. Last but not least on our list is Rhino Hero Super Battle, in which you and up to three other adults will be playing a very adult game about being an adult, in which you are a, a spandex wearing rhino and you're stacking uh, playing cards into to make pretty houses. On your turn, you will have three of these cards in front of you. Now, they're weird shaped because they're actually gonna be working as the floors of the building that you'll be constructing together. On those cards, you might see a couple of symbols, like for example, two yellow long walls or one green short wall. Using one of these cards, the choice is yours, you'll be placing those relevant buildings onto this grid. So here you can see that these red dots represent structural points where you can start your building. So for example, I've got something that's asking for two yellow long walls here, which means that I grab two of the long walls and place them on these red dots, and then I can place a floor between them. And congratulations, you've started your new building project. 
Now you'll pass your turn to the next player who will also be looking at their hand of cards. And maybe they've got two short walls and this is all seeming very simple. And you've played this kind of game before, you're building something up and putting stuff on top of it. You're essentially building a house of cards together and waiting for someone to make it fall. But it's a little bit more complicated than that. And that's why this game is of course for adults. Now, these three dice here are gonna be pretty integral once you've finished your turn, because after you've constructed your floor, you're gonna to have to roll this baby blue one to see if you manage to move up any floors, because not only are you building a building, but you're also represented by these little figures. You can either be a super elephant, or a super giraffe, or a, a super rhino, or a, a super penguin. It's just, just so you know, it's an adult game. And as you roll this die, you'll be given a number. In, for example, I have taken number two, which means that I have to move up two floors. Floors are horizontal, which means that you can have multiple separate things acting as one floor. In this case, I have to go up one and then two. After placing that figure down, I'm then gonna check if my card had a symbol on it that looks like this. This is a spider monkey, which means that I have to grab one of these spider monkey tokens and then also hang that off of the floor that I placed. Now you can see that this is a little bit tricky to do and it's already starting to wobble and we've barely even started putting things on top of it. I'm gonna do it on this side. Just makes me feel a little bit more safe. As the game goes on, you'll be adding more and more bits to this building. And in fact, you'll also be building on top of stuff that you've already placed down as you watch this building get taller and taller and taller. And as you can see, these spider monkeys have a finite supply, which means that once you've placed all four of them, you might have to grab one from a lower point of the construction and take it up to a higher floor. Now we played this live at EGX, so if you'd like to see some gameplay of this, it's available for you right now. Unfortunately, that stream cut in half, so it's a little bit tricky to tell what's going on. But now that you know the rules, you know that this is quite difficult. Now, Rhino Hero Super Battle, as you can probably tell, is of course a game for adults, which means that there's no silliness to be found. All of the art is very gray and uh, not colorful at all, and obviously very serious. And it, it asks you to, to think about life's great questions, like for example, how tall can a building really be if a building is always going to fall over? And if I make that building fall over, then Am I really a hero? Oh dear. Looks like your facade has fallen as well as the building, which means that I'm guessing the, the person who knocked the building over loses the game, right? Well, actually not quite. You know how we moved that character pawn up to a different floor of the building? Well, whoever holds the highest position in the building will be grabbing this medal. When you hold this medal, you are in the highest position of all the other players in the game. So for example, if Miss Giraffe here went all the way to the top, she would then take the medal. Now this is both a blessing and a curse because if you're holding this medal when the tower falls, that means that you win the game. But if you're holding this medal and you make the tower fall, that means that everybody else wins the game. If you manage to get yourself onto the same floor as another person, you'll have a super battle, which basically means that you'll each roll a die, and whoever gets the highest number stays, and whoever gets the lower number has to move down a floor. These can chain into multiple interactions. So as you've got this incredibly wobbly tower swaying in the wind, you're having to pick up your pawn again and again, moving it from floor to floor, perhaps even picking up spider monkeys along the way. It takes that idea of reverse Jenga where you're grabbing cards and moving them up as you build something slowly rather than having something already built and making it weaker over time and adds lots of tricky little complications that aren't difficult to learn but are difficult to do the more cards you play. It's a very, very fun game and yes, all right, it's for kids. It's for children, as you can see, it's a bright, colorful cartoon box that was obviously designed for people who are five and up. However, we're still above five years old, you know? I don't care if you're an adult, you can still enjoy Superhero Rhino Battle or whatever the hell it's called, all right? It's a game about stacking things and that's okay. I'm Michael Whelan and I approve this message. Well, thank you very much for watching this admittedly 
quite sloppy video about the best dexterity games in my collection. Now, I'm sure there's many more dexterity games that we could talk about, and if you've got a few that you are quite passionate about as well, why not shove them in the comments? We might even try and play a few of these on the channel. In fact, I think we might even try and bring CubeQuest to a live event, because it is very, very good. I cannot stress that enough. Thanks very much for watching, and if you enjoyed this, then there are plenty more videos from Dicebreaker that you can check out. In fact, there's a couple at the bottom of the screen right now. If you click on this big circle here, then you will also subscribe to the channel, which is very, very useful for us, and it means that you get to see more of our content. Now, if you're already a subscriber to the channel and you're not seeing our videos in your feed, you can hit the little bell icon below this video right now, and that will give you a notification every time we upload. So thanks very much, I'll see you soon, and have a lovely day. Thank you.